Hi, everybody. It is so wonderful to be here tonight. I was like completely blown away when they asked me to do this. I thought, geez, what were they thinking? <laughs> Anyhow, so as you gather, I'll do my Vanna White. Okay, so our topic tonight is heirloom, right? And I like to talk about the halo of meaning that surrounds objects because objects talk to me, and that's not schizophrenia. It's, it's literally, you know, and I try and be really, really quiet and spend time with objects, they, they actually say things to me. Anyhow, and so we're gonna share some of that with you tonight. If I can get the chummy here to work. See, I'm a Newfoundlander now, I say chummy. Okay, <laughs> okay. Our topic tonight, heirloom, is a juicy one. It's ripe with meaning. My task as keynote speaker is to throw notes around. No, 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 is to approach it holistically, to probe its emotional, spiritual, and social dimensions because this is the halo of meaning that surrounds the practice of creating, bestowing, receiving, and perpetuating heirlooms. Quite aside from my love affair with the material charms of handmade objects, it is what they say about us. Humans that fascinate me. And I'd like to thank the organizers. <laughs> okay. Be, for the opportunity to think about this. It's like this aspect of the not so secret life of objects. Okay? The word heirloom has broad interpretations, which you get a sense of when you look at it in the French as heritage. Heirloom seeds, now let's see if I can get this guy to work here. Ah, et voila. Okay, heirloom seeds are also called heritage seeds and great and vernacular homes that have been passed down in families for centuries are designated similarly. In botanical terms, the plant and seed varieties identified as heirloom refer to those predating the agricultural practice of monoculture farming and those that have ethnic significance, like Romano beans to Rome. But I want to narrow down my use of the word to focus for the sake of this talk's brevity and clarity. So when I say heirloom, I don't usually think of it as a vegetable or a plant terminology, although I did find one lovely example that serves the multiple botanical, craft, and personal senses of the word, of heirloom. Okay, we have Margaret here. Margaret Walsh Best. Margaret Walsh Best is a watercolorist, and I consider that a craft, by the way, who specializes in scientifically accurate paintings of plants. She's a Newfoundlander who is the daughter of a British mum who came to pre-confederation, pro the province, it wasn't province then, it was something else, anyhow, pre-confederation as a war bride when the young Brit came to settle with her husband and create a new life, she brought with her seeds for a garden. Now, strictly speaking, these would be called heirloom seeds. Their daughter, Margaret, who you see before you, would grow up in that garden and was taught about each of its plants. In essence, Margaret's garden came from the other side of the Atlantic, effectively, it had been in her family for generations. But most importantly, I share this story with you because it is an example of how the careful and loving attention to growing things got transplanted across an ocean and generations to be, to be eventually transformed into daughter Margaret's studious craft and subject matter. Let's see if I can get one. Okay, this is her digitalis plant as a detail. You're right, you use that for, it prevents heart attacks, apparently. When I accepted this ass assignment, I started asking myself, what are the essential attributes of an heirloom? How, for example, is it different than, say, a souvenir? Both are objects that fulfill a ritual and symbolic function. They are impregnated with memories. Like much of craft today, they are tangible objects it was a little fly in my face. He's not so tangible anymore. 
Anyhow, large, okay, tangible objects with a largely intangible function. Now, come on, work, okay. What I wanted you, okay, this is the raspberry plants, right? <clears throat> In Margaret's gardens. Anyhow, and let's take a look at this treasure keeper by PEI potter Robert McMillan, which I hope many locals and visitors to PEI purchase. If you ask me, this lidded vessel is not about keeping th rings or paper clips tidy back at the ranch. It's about keeping memories from a vacation or a business trip. That is what makes the color of the 100% lead-free glazes and the scene it depicts appropriate. Place, memory. Now, memory may be a common denominator between souvenir and heirloom, but what about place? A souvenir unites a person to place through memory, whereas an heirloom unites two or more people, but not necessarily by place. Although in the example of the seeds, it apparently allowed the sharing of place across generations. Margaret Walsh Best's mother brought her memories and those of her ancestors. But it was not just place, but rather the concept of home that was significant. The creation of home through food and sustenance probably had a role to play with gardening as well. And during the wartime food shortages, mm, gardens became especially important. But lest we digress, the garden seeds were transplanting home quite literally despite distance. The place, quotation marks, in terms of a souvenir is the destination, the place, in terms of an heirloom, is home. Okay? This notion of transplanting across geographical distance and time made me wonder about portability. Come on. Is portability a defining attribute of heirlooms? I went to a cemetery to think about it. Tombstones surrounded me, hand-carved, charged with memories. These were objects that united people across generations. But they weren't exactly portable or mobile. What about those heritage homes? I decided that in the case of the homes, heritage was simply a modifier. It was not a noun. Ditto for the tombstones. Portability made the defining attribute list. And you guys can start making this little list in your head if you want. Okay? This notion of transplanting across geographical distance and time made me wonder about portability. Is portability a defining attribute of an heirloom? Anyhow, the combination of the cemetery and my thoughts on portability brought me to, next slide, reliquaries. Portable shrines that housed relics and often the remains of a saint associated with extraordinary powers. If you talk to most craft people, their objects have extraordinary powers too. Okay, all of a sudden, that halo of meaning took on a new glow. Veneration, special powers. I remember working on Peter Pounding's retrospective back in 1996 and asking him about the significance and the origin of his reliquary series. He explained that he'd been sparked by a conversation with his young son about what was precious. A reliquary was not about religion, per se, for them. A reliquary was a treasure box, but not necessarily for gold. A sense of the non-monetarily precious joined the list of defining attributes for heirloom. Okay? So we've talked about portability. Now we have precious, but not necessarily expensive. In preparation for this presentation, I had fun. No, no. <laughs> 
I did. But anyway, in, pre in preparation for this presentation, I tried to ask as many diverse individuals as possible if they had an heirloom and what was its story. One woman mentioned to me that her most treasured heirloom was her great-grandmother's dinner platter. Actually, we talked about that on the radio the other day. I asked what, it, what made it so special. Yes, its age was a factor, but she glossed over that aspect. In explanation, she offered that she did not have a photograph of her great-grandmother, and that the only way her daughter would ever know this matriarch was through that platter. The platter would be, no doubt, a magnet for storytelling, a recalling of family narratives, but I also could detect that the platter was also important because it had been handled and used it contained the energy of the great-grandmother. And the newest generation of that family would participate in that sharing of intimate, familiar energy. The woman telling me about this heirloom was a dance instructor. We were on the sidelines of a ballroom dance floor. I could only imagine the treasured platter, visualize in my mind's eye its clay, the body, the brushwork, the decoration, she didn't know if it was handmade or not. The handled, that part she knew about. It was handled for sure. Okay, now to the piano. One heirloom that was most likely handmade surprised me. It was a piano that had been in Michael Waterman's family. His daughter was the fifth generation in the family to play it. Now, a baby grand is not exactly portable. But this one had been transported many, many times. Even in Michael's adulthood, the piano had traveled from his home in Saskatchewan to New York City, where his father's wife was studying, to Ontario. And when they returned to Canada and eventually to Newfoundland, where she is now Dean of Music, Michael is an inventor of instruments and sound installations. There he is. OK, this one's Michael. And he's as crazy as a kite. <laughs> Anyhow. So, I was just tell telling you he, in he invents instruments. And he makes sound installations. And so there's not just like, like what he's playing here that he's blowing into is actually a very large wind instrument, OK? But that's not the, the limit of them. Okay. His installations are absolutely bewitching. So music and creativity runs deep in his family. Michael Waterman was not the only one to have an heirloom piano. A few others were mentioned to me, although they had not been in the family as long. Waterman builds his installations as robots out of repurposed household electronics and appliances. It is not unusual to find the guts of a baby monitor, like you know, the things that tell you what the kid is doing in the bedroom, right? That kind of baby monitor. A vacuum cleaner and a disemboweled computer on a studio table. But speaking of music and electronics, do you want to know what really surprised me? Two subjects independently told me that they had considered their Walkman tape decks as heirlooms. <laughs> this is what I love. I couldn't make this stuff up, right? OK, so further questioning revealed that they had a parent and a grandparent, respectively, that would compile cassette mixtapes of music from their own young adulthoods. So it was like passing down of memories. It was an auditory version of a comfort blanket. Oddly enough, in the recent Marvel film, Guardians of the Galaxy, the hero resorts to an ancient Walkman to put him into a resourceful state to conquer evil. It plays a mixtape prepared by his mom, who he lost at an early age. And this is what intrigued me. We use technology and objects to deal with loss and longing, to fashion one-of-a-kind, custom-made solutions. So technology it's not necessarily the evil thing we think it is, right? Technology facilitates the making of the unique heirloom. That's a close-up. He 
calls these things the, um, a chorus of robots. I went to one opening and one of them set on fire, which was very exciting. <laughs> oh, and that's B. That's my hand. One of the heirlooms most commonly cited, rings were the most plentiful, followed by pendants. They were durable, they crossed the borders of time, people, place, and preciousness. Now, this account stands out for me for its subversive flair. I like a little subversive. One neighbor, a Cuban filmmaker, Tamara Segura, told me that when she left Cuba, she took an ant's ring. She was supposed to be going to Montreal for Concordia's film study program and return to Cuba, but Tamara had other plans. The ring had been in her family for generations, was mended and handed down, not from mother to daughter, but from aunt to niece upon leaving the maternal home for marriage. And why I put my ring in there is that my family also has the same custom. And I'm Austrian by background. Okay. This is my lovely Tamara here. And she was on the red carpet the other week in Halifax for her, her, her premiere. In Cuba, Tamara took the ring to replace the extended family she was leaving behind. She believed it would keep her safe in a strange land and still permits her to remain connected with her homeland. Now, growing up in a country where less than 5% attended ca conventional Catholic church, Tamara participates in her ancestral and Santeria. Now, that surprised me. I don't know about you guys, but I had this notion that, okay, if you're Latin, you're probably Catholic, you know, in your background. But when I actually started looking, it was the Catholic Church cited 65% of Cuba were Catholics. But when you actually looked at the stats deeply, it turned out that 5% said they went to church and 1.5% actually attended on a regular basis. So I thought that was interesting. Anywho, so what Tamara participates in is her ancestral religion. It's Santeria. Okay? And it has African Yoruba practices. As a result, she referred to the ring not as an heirloom. She called it her fetish. Ah, I like that. Anyhow, this quote from Tamara will give you an idea of the ancestral and ethnic roots of her faith and her fetish. And that's a Santeria altar. Woke up early in the morning to light some candles to Ochun and pray. La Vergine de la Caridad de Coble was, was found in my home's province, territorial waters during a storm back in 1612. The people who found her were three lost sailors in a small boat. An 11 years old, that was, that was her, this is a direct quote, 11 years old slave called Juan, an Indian young man with the same name, and another Juan, son of a Spanish couple, but born in the colony. Now, making a cafe con leche with honey from far away San Juan de Terranova, I salute the morning and celebrate my Yoruba heritage, my Spanish blood, my Chinese ancestors, and my Tinino roots. Ochun Cachita. Does somebody need to get that? <laughs> La Vergen is the goddess of understanding. Anyhow, and the reason why I put that quote in there is because I had this notion that you know Cubans were either Cuban or they were Spanish and I and I really just didn't appreciate the complexity of their backgrounds and it was only when I started talking to her about her ring and, and hearing her describe it as a fetish that I began to get a sense actually of you know it was like seeing the tip of the iceberg relics and fetishes these are objects endowed with superpowers to heal to protect, and perhaps to harm. They are common to the world religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Catholicism, and shamanism, amongst others. Every culture has ring bearing as a custom, also has a folk legend or a myth about magical rings. From Greek and Norse legends to J.R.R. Tolkien and the comic book universe, where heroes such as the Green Lantern Rings have been associated with powers beyond decoration. These, their specialness or unique features seems a good fit for the world of craft, 
its specialized skills, and its creative personalities. What I'd like to bring forward in both the examples of the heirloom platter and ring is the underlying sense of loss. I think there's a sense of loss implicit in these stories. Now, it could be more complex or ambiguous than that. The platter acknowledges the loss of the matriarch, the ring, the loss of the home. Do heirlooms admit our mortality and limitations? Maybe a, du a duality best expresses the reality. We are, or we are faced with the impermanent and the fragile nature of, of the people and the relationships we value, and we try to remedy the situation with an object that we safeguard and entrust to another generation. That ain't luxury. Heirlooms are necessarily social. They require at least two parties, and preferably more. There's a give and take to them. They need to be given and then received or inherited. A pitcher and a catcher. Okay, I'm talk about ring lore. Now, if you will, the pitcher and catcher stuff, it suggests a complicit agreement to the relationship or the social rules. One of my interview subjects gave me a good belly laugh. When I asked Brian if he had an heirloom, he said, oh yes, yep. And he started to tell me that once, while he was working out west, far from home in Newfoundland, as many of our guys do, his mother had sent him a gift with the express intention that it be something that lasted and had value and meaning for him. I thought that sounded like an heirloom in the making, maybe. And I was curious for a younger per perspective of a 30-something man. So I encouraged him to continue his story. It turned out she had sent him cash. with the proviso that he gets something of endurance and meaning. So I asked him what happened next, to which he responded, talk about this, right, Louise Pence, and, and like objects and immortality. That's, she actually has done a lot of reliquary urns. Okay, come on, do it for me. There's Brian. So I said to Brian, what happened next? And he said, I got a tattoo. This, Brian is a musician. And so you'll see sheet music on his upper arm. And he has struggled, like a lot of studio musicians I know, with addiction. And that is the logo of the rehab center on this arm. All of his tattoos have to do with strength. So, the design was his own, and you could say that a tattoo's needlework. <laughs> but before you dismiss tattoo as heritage or as heirloom, I should point out that I've seen a lot of them that are family crests. Much as we'd like to control heirlooms, we can't. They assume a life of their own and they often evolve over time. They acquire layers of meaning as they pass from hand to hand. For example, my paternal grandmother was an Irish nurse who reportedly served in Queen Victoria's court. When she wanted to marry, Elizabeth Ryan was obliged to give up nursing. She packed up her things in, a tea, in tea barrels that I could still recall in my mother's basement. Now, somehow, she managed to bring an unbroken set of small drinking glasses from England to Canada. You can see them there, although they're very transparent, so they're hard to register on the camera. So, my grandmother, or Nani, as I used to call her, and my mom were both employed by Lord and Lady Carling, like the brewing family, and my mom was the cook. Nani was the nurse. So the glasses, which you can just see the tip of here. OK. So what she did is that she put them in Russian tin holders. They became Russian drinking glasses for her. You know, like you, the, the tea glasses. Anywho. So 
and her Nani's son was a flat-footed Irish cop who became my dad, and his badge is actually my most treasured heirloom. If I ever get a tattoo, that's what it's going to be. So, anyway, back to the tea glasses. Decades ago, I spent six weeks in Turkey where the chai boys fascinated me. Do I have a chai boy picture? Yeah, there's a chai boy. Okay. These were little boys who would run and fetch tea for the merchants and their customers in the bazaars. I was impressed. They could run so fast and never spill a drop or break a glass. They seemed to come out of nowhere. I mean, like the, the carpet dealers would come and go like this and zip, a chai boy would appear. Anyhow, my son, who is not a chai boy, <laughs> considers it a treat to drink from Nani's glasses and inevitably I'm asked to tell him one of my Turkish adventures as we sip mint tea sweetened with sugar that I ritually collect on travels. Inside my head, I can hear my Nani's oh-so-proper accent admonishing me for visiting a heathen country and bringing back their practices. Now, for the record, the glasses are mouth-blown, but with molds, and the tin holders are likely early industrial. It's a tasteful blend of the old cheap and the newer cheap. I wouldn't be bringing them to the antique roadshow for appraisal. But that does raise the specter of collectibles. Oh dear. This fine lady is called Lady Canada, and I think she's got like 165 Swarovski crystals on her. This was actually the illustration, and, but I mean, she's like a Barbie doll, right? People pay $99 for her in advance. <laughs> Anyhow, collectibles, you see, part of what I was doing is, is like, like when I started this off, I was looking at the stuff in the cemetery, I was looking at the souvenir, and so now I'm looking at collectibles, and I'm trying to figure out how are they the same or different from, from heirlooms. Collectibles have a value determined by a different economy and marketplace than heirlooms, although they can overlap. As Monique La Jeunesse of Little River Hot Glass recounted to me, come on, right, there's their perfume bottles. <clears throat> One customer came to her and she leaned over the counter in Vermont and said, hand on hip, right? I collect Lalique, who are you? One thing I learned in my research is that the most collected color is red whether it is a figurine or a Helen Frankenthaler print. I was a little distressed by how few of the heirlooms that I was being told about by people from all walks of life and ages were handmade. So I thought if I asked my colleagues who were professional craftspeople or curators what their heirlooms were, I might find more handmade items. I hope that wasn't cheating. Denis Longchamp, who is now at the Burlington Art Center, was my next target. Success! Yes, he has an heirloom, and it is handmade. It's a small hooked map by his mom. She made it when she was 16, and that's about 70 years ago. It shows a windmill and was made as a project in a home economics class. When Madame Longchamp sold her matrimonial home, the map was found in her hope chest what Denis called her wedding trunk, along with the paper pattern it was made from. The chest contained other domestic textiles, like embroidered tea towels that were distributed among the siblings. But Denis, he got the mat. And that is part of its sentiment, sentimental value because it acknowledged the common bond of appreciating craft between mother and son. So, <clears throat> I'm going to quote Denis here. <clears throat> Take a little sip of water from my French accent. I'm not going to try and do the French accent. I do have a few other textiles, heirloom, including placemats woven by my grandmother, mom's mom, as well as two blankets, Catalon. They are made with recycled cloths of all kind. I remember grandma cutting old shirts and dresses into fine strips and rolling them, then sitting at the loom 
weaving the blankets, mats, placemats, and so on. The loom was borrowed, but I'm not sure from where. The co-op, maybe, or a family member. I have lots of childhood memories attached to Grandma's farmhouse. We all did work at the farm, from picking strawberries and raspberries to tending the cows in the fields or feeding the chicken. Mm. At last, I had found an heir and a loom. Still, there was something missing in my heirloom inventory. Anybody want to guess? All at once? No? Father figure. That's what I was hoping for. Because all these things had come from mums, right? I was hoping to find a male gendered handmade heirloom. Little fly is going to drive me crazy. Okay, off I trot, 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 to St. John's Potter, Alexis Templeton, and that's a sample of her work, <clears throat> with whom I've often discussed the influence of her father and how she conducts her business. Maybe he has left her an heirloom. Alexis, bing, lights up like a Christmas tree when I broach the topic. She has an heirloom that she can't label. Alexis says that when the children were together after her father's passing, it was simply called the thing from father's workbench. She needs to show it to me. This part, it feels like a metal brick. It fits in my hand. And as you can see, there's holes that are bored into it. And it's almost like they're like a gauge. And I don't know if it was meant for putting in different sizes of things or for measuring things or, or exactly what. And this was his hammer as well that went with it. And he was a businessman by profession. So this was a little, uh, a little different than you might have ex expected from him. So I call it a mini anvil. Alexa says she remembers her father hammering all manner of things that needed fixing on. This, to me, is an ideal memory. And a splendid role for craft to play. Relatively few of us may create with our hands, but all of us need to fix and be mended and be restored. Consequently, I also came across two heirlooms associated with fathers in railroading. Last week, I was working with the city of St. John's on their art collection, <clears throat> which gave homicidal rage whole new meaning to me. But <laughs> I'm not going to tell you about that part. Anyhow, I found myself sitting beside a chap who was new to the portfolio of culture. His name was Todd. And Todd told me his heirloom was a railroader's watch that had been passed down to him through his father and that it dated from the 1920s. I suspect that watches are to male heirs what rings are to female heirs. They're ritualized objects. They are both worn close to the body, but there's a sense of precision and function with a watch. I was also curious about the connection between heirlooms and holiday traditions, which are often a staple of many family memories. Women, it seems, she says cheerfully, were connected with objects like Christmas ornaments or Easter eggs. Now, both genders were associated with books. George Eliot Clark, the novelist known for his narratives about Africadians, also had a father who worked on the railroad. He recalls that as a child of six or seven, he received a book about John Henry, an African-American hero. George writes, this is a quote, he was famous because he could drill through stone faster than any steam drill, which came into use during his lifetime. Guys like him were facing economic extinction because this new steam drill was putting them out of business, so to speak." End quote. He went on to explain that the book, which he received 48 years ago, represented to him his bond with his father. And the threatening steam drill and the economic extinction reminded me of our fears in the craft community. There's something almost childlike in our fears that craft as we know it might disappear from society. 
We are like children faced with our mothers wanting to give away our grown-up toys. My son used to say to me, Mom, you want to give away my memories. So we got a crate, and I branded it the memory box. And he got to decide what went inside. I was trying to give him some sense of control, but with limitations. What will our solution in the craft world be? Is it the craft museum? A collection? Is that some version of a memory box? We live in a consumer society that is choked with objects. Clever advertisers try to sell us experiences along with objects. Instinctively, we know that we cannot indulge in nostalgia. Otherwise, we might end up in a shipwreck of dysfunctional family emotions like a Peppa Chan doll. This is Peppa's doll, which I bought at the last, um, they have a 24-hour art marathon. And what she did is she cut apart old dolls and she stitched them together in bizarre combinations. And she also did uh, furry uh, plushy animals. And I thought that was really intriguing too because th this whole thing about furry culture and fetishes, I mean, there's, there's lo lots going on there. You have to read my blog about that one. <laughs> Anyhow, I picked this image because it re to me that one was like, you know, like you're, taking my, you're taking my memories, right? So, when Stephen Levy and Martin Rumack, the ent entrepreneurs who owned and managed the one-of-a-kind craft fair for 21 years, did their original consumer research to identify what associations the public had with the word craft, it discovered that it was, in Stephen's words, quote, something pioneers did to survive, end quote. It wasn't very sexy. And that's how the 10 days of the best Christmas shopping was created to promote the fair. It's also the reason why I kicked my feet in delight. Ah, ha, ha. You want to see what made Glory kick her feet? That. Sin City Crafters because it was a renegade craft fair. And I promptly attended, attended and I spent every cent in my pocket. I didn't need any of this stuff. <laughs> Anyhow, I think, I don't think consumerism is the demon we are tempted to think that it is. You know, like we, we, we demonize technology. We, I think we demonize consumerism as well. Consumerism is not the same thing as materialism. Consumerism is a more benign philosophy, and it is not based solely on the acquisition or shop till you drop. Okay? It's on differentiation and identity. It can accommodate a social conscience, conscience, and that's why the new branding of craft is, in my opinion, a good thing. With apologies to Martha Stewart. Anyhow. What emotions we decide to wrap craft objects in is go what's going to be crucial. Are heirlooms going to be the end of craft in a digital age or a new beginning? We still crave objects. They are a reflection of how we see ourselves and our relationships. That's why I believe craft has a future. It's an expression of self-identity, our current values and our desires, as well as our past. Craft can declare what groups we identify with and how we are different from others. Heirlooms express our quest for permanency and authentic, authentic emotional connection. They're more than props. Craft today, even though it may be non-functional, still maintains its reference to the warp and weft of function and materials. It allows us to express a personal and cultural continuity. Heirlooms reflect our need to share and be shared. And I cannot think of a more essential or better role for craft to play in the future. Thank you.